Here's an idea. Everybody has a right to be forgotten. Let's say tomorrow you enter and win a hot dog eating contest. You just house the competition. Dog after dog, you are an unstoppable Frank Mangler. People are so impressed, they take out their phones, they make videos, everything. And then 10 years from now, after many considered life choices, including becoming a serious vegetarian, you're applying for a job at PETA. Except right there on YouTube for all to see, your face, the hot dog ellipse, Hamageddon, Thank you for your resume, we'll be in touch. Or far more realistically, though hopefully unlikely, let's say you go bankrupt. A bunch of years pass, you get back on your feet, steady job, no debt, feeling good, you wanna buy a house. You go to the bank and the lending agent simply Googles your name, bankruptcy. And there you are, years ago, on some public record, fiscal pants around your fiscal ankles. You are a risk and so, no loan. In both of these situations, the internet's impeccable memory could lead to trouble. But at this point, you might be asking, who is gonna Google, really, for a loan? The human torch was denied a bank loan. Well, let's talk actualities. Mario Costejo Gonzalez from Spain had lots of debt in the 90s, so much so that his house was foreclosed upon. A newspaper then reported on the foreclosure. Costejo Gonzalez paid his debts, and while his financial troubles disappeared, that newspaper report did not. It even got digitized and put on the internet. A simple Google search brought it right up. He asked the newspaper to take it down, and they wouldn't. He asked Google Spain to remove it, and they said that he had to talk to Google US. The whole thing ended up in the Spanish courts, who then took it to the highest EU court, who said that Google has to unindex those search results. They point to things which are no longer useful or noteworthy, and so the European Court of Justice ruled that Google must comply with Costejo Gonzalez's request and provide similar functionality for others. If there is public information about private citizens indexed by search engines, and those private citizens want that public information gone, gone. And so begins the discussion of the right to be forgotten. Well, sort of. Much older and not specifically internet French and Italian laws provide what is called a right of oblivion, where a convict can block printing of details regarding their misdeeds after they have paid their debt to society. This emphasis on personal privacy might seem extreme to many Americans, which we'll talk about in a second, but it does have a foot in history. Victor Meyer Schoenberger, the author of Delete, The Virtue of Forgetting in the Digital Age, talked to The New Yorker about how personal information collected innocently by European cities in the early early 20th century was used by the Nazis to track people down by religion and ethnicity. He suggests that Europe's past inspires a suspicion towards permanent comprehensive records, that their attitude towards collecting and storing personal data is a careful one. Google's head counsel agrees that this careful attitude is, quote, a European concept, and given that, the right to be forgotten needs limiting, he says. Which it is limited to Europe. Currently, if Google unindexes a search result from Google.com, .es or .fr or .de at the request of a European citizen, that search result is still indexed on google.com. The EU courts are suggesting but ultimately can't force Google and other search engines like Yahoo and Bing, who are also unindexing search results in the EU, to adopt the right to be forgotten worldwide. Google has even basically said, um, yeah, no. That's not gonna happen. Why would they say that? Well, there are three big concerns, and here is where we get to some of the America stuff. One, does this encroach on the freedom of speech? Bloggers, journalists, publishers, they should be able to write about whatever they want, even if the people it's about aren't super psyched about it. Concern two, same issue, different angle. Is this censorship? If someone can zap stuff about them that they don't like out of existence, that seems bad. Costejo Gonzalez himself has said, I support freedom of expression and do not defend censorship. What I did was fight for the right to request deletion of data that violates the honor, dignity, and reputation of individuals. The EU Commission even wrote that the right to be forgotten isn't about making prominent people less prominent or criminals less criminal. In other words, freedom of expression and from censorship and the right to be forgotten are not mutually exclusive. NNG Andrade has suggested reconsidering the right to be forgotten as the right to be different from oneself. It's not about censorship as much as it's about how perfect memory can sometimes be an enemy of the future. 
Imagining people complexly through the network is already tough. We're different people in different places at different times. Maybe the right to be forgotten prevents becoming unfairly chained to your past. Which brings us to concern number three. Does this allow the rewriting of history? We've argued on Idea Channel before that even the smallest bit of seeming ephemera could hold great historical significance. Now, are we saying that some of it should just get axed? But Google's not deleting things, they're unindexing search results. So maybe the bigger question is whether people should be allowed to bury or disconnect from their own past. That is a big question. I see a related anxiety on social media when people habitually write posts and then delete them not long after. There are lots of reasons you might do this. Maybe you post something you instantly regret, or maybe you write something inflammatory with every intention of deleting it immediately. Sort of like internet shouting into a pillow. Or so you have a high follower count with not much content. But some people post and delete because having a persistent publicly available self-document is terrifying or embarrassing or just weird. I've heard some people refer to this as delete culture, and developers, at least, are responding to this desire to be forgotten, to always already be forgotten, to have never been remembered by the internet. Apps like Snapchat, Yik Yak, Secret, Whisper, and a surprising number of others, so many sources in the doobly-doo, are premised on impermanence, anonymity, or both. Of course, as some of us learned the hard way with Snapchat, impermanence doesn't necessarily equate with deletion. And as for the others, time will tell exactly how anonymous they really are. Personally, I don't post anything on Yik Yak that I wouldn't say to my own mother. Hi. Mom. Anyway, the right to be forgotten, delete culture, these apps, they all speak to the perceived, though possibly actual, effective permanence and influence of the internet. Many people feel like if they put themselves on it, or if their selves end up on it, it will become monumentalized. It will tower over, transcend some self that they hope eventually to become. Reputation.com's founder sees it as unfair that Disney or Fox or Viacom can handily have their media scrubbed from Google's search index, but such a thing is nearly unthinkable for a private citizen's public data, even if that public data is out of date. The question is whether private citizens do have the same right to control their public data as media empires do over their copyrighted material. Some people say yes, some people say all people do, and that the right to be forgotten is and should be considered nothing short of a universal right a human right. Ultimately, the effectiveness of and potential damage caused by enforcing such a right will be determined by the way it is implemented and how people use it or abuse it. But before we get to that point, it's worth reasoning out what it means to support such a right to be... I, I, I just completely lost my train of thought. Um... What were we talking about? What do you guys think? Does everyone have a right to be forgotten? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe. Subjectivity in my journalism? It's more likely than you'd think. Let's see what you guys had to say about objectivity, journalism, and serial. First things first, office hours are this weekend on Saturday, February 7th at the IBM Pavilion 590 Madison Avenue in Manhattan, New York. Come and hang out. Gonna be there from one to three. There's no plan, just gonna chill have a conversation, meet each other. I'm really excited. Um, there's no plan of where I will be since it is a private public space, so we can't really reserve anything. But if you don't see me, just look for my super bright orange backpack. I will have this with me and um, you can see it from space, so I should be pretty easy to find. Second order of business, next week's episode is about the Legend of Korra finale. So if you haven't seen it, you can. You don't necessarily have to watch it to understand what we're going to talk about, but having the background wouldn't hurt Legend of Korra, book four. It's really good anyway, so you should just watch it. Okay, finally, on the comments, Joe Hansen from It's Okay To Be Smart left a comment saying that he was shocked we didn't get to Jay Rosen's idea of the view from nowhere, this idea that journalists are able to view the world from nowhere, from a place that is free of ideology, free of background information, which is a place that doesn't really exist. And Joe goes on to talk about the really important idea of authority and how audiences give authority to journalists and 
um, news networks and broadcasters, and there is a question of why we do that and whether or not we are maybe about to stop. And I think that this comment is so, so great. I wrote a pretty long response to it, um, and then there was a great conversation that followed. So links to this one and the rest in the doobly-doo. Matri Ryu from the subreddit hits on the really important uh, factor of entertainment in journalism, and uh, Googleplex Byte also sort of hits on this same thing by saying that journalism can't be objective because objectivity doesn't sell. And this is a big thing that I think about all the time, whether or not journalism should or should not be competing on the level of entertainment. And I feel like a lot of times it feels like it has to, I don't know that that's true. And related to this idea, Jakers457 seems to suggest that ideally the news would just be explanations of things that have happened, just pure information. And absent the problem of even the gathering of information being objective, which, you know, there's a great conversation about whether or not that's a thing that's even possible, right? It's like, is just the easy and simple relaying of information a thing that people will tune into? I skeptical. Skeptical face. Rabbit Jarris and a couple other people said, if I am presenting one side of an argument like it's the truth and then moving on with a clear conscience, how are they to trust me? And my response to that is don't. If there is one thing that I would hope you would take away from Idea Channel is that if there is a face on a screen telling you things, you should ask questions about it. Don't take what it's saying at its own face value. You need to ask questions about everything. Don't trust Idea Channel, even a little. Just don't. Cadwell Turnbill, Krista Duggan, Kyle Sweeney, and Astro Flyers have all recommended awesome additional reading materials on these topics. They also all have great names. Included in there is um, Hank Green's Medium piece about his experience interacting with um, legacy media, which is just a, a, I love it, legacy media. And finally, Kayla Halfley brings up the missing component of judgment, that ideally objective journalism would lack any kind of judgment. And I keep going back to this idea of entertainment masquerading as journalism, and I think that the source of a lot of that entertainment is when those news broadcasters and journalists leverage some kind of judgment because, you know, drama is profitable. And yeah, I think that this is definitely part of this conversation. This week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of these Frank Manglers. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit links in the doobly-doo. And the tweets of the week come from Cena Breyer, who points towards me and Kate Beaton accidentally collaborating to make the Twitter timeline do a thing. And Jacobonot, who points us towards savedbythebellhooks.tumblr.com. You should read it so that we have something to talk about on Saturday. Oh, and one more thing. So we built out the Idea Channel set in order to be able to do bigger and more impressive things, but uh, if you look over here, it's actually really boring and not fun to stand in front of or look at. So I was thinking it might be nice if you guys were to send us records to put on the wall because I would love to have something that's not just my records, my musical taste. Um, so uh, we have a P.O. box for a very short amount of time. It will expire. There's info in the doobly-doo, including some um, restrictions and some rules for sending us things, so make sure you check those out. But if you want to send us records and or record covers to maybe put on the Idea Channel set to be shown on camera, I would love that. I would really love that. And of course you will get credit somehow, somewhere. We'll figure it out.